Welcome to Rivers United Church Online. My name is John Hunter. I'm the lead pastor of Rivers United Church. I want to welcome you to our online church experience. Thank you so much for being with us today. Today, we are continuing a series about the life of Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, a disciple that literally led the movement that changed the world. And so what we're looking at is, is some lessons from his life that might be able to apply to ours, and I believe that they really do. Last Sunday, we took a look at where he started, that this incredible man that did some incredible things uh, didn't really start off that way, that he was a everyday man. Um, he dealt with everyday struggles. He had problems with language. He was a fisherman. He, he wasn't the most educated person, but that God used him in an incredible way because he started to follow Jesus. And uh, so if you missed last week, you can go to our website and watch that about how do we start, right? How do we start to follow? Today, we're going to take a look at the greatest lesson I believe that Jesus taught him that changed everything in this man's life. And I don't know that he got it during the lesson, but it definitely showed up later in this guy's life. And it's this, how do you deal with the storms in life? You know what I mean by that? Not just physical storms, although that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. But I'm talking about when the storms of life hit. <laughs> and I won't tell you what they are, but if you're going through them, you definitely know what that is. Where you feel like, I can't get past this. It doesn't make sense. And today we're going to talk about how do you do it? What's the lesson from the storm? Because I got a feeling this one, it could change everything. It could change your whole perspective about how you see life, okay? So we're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, I'll put it up here on the screen. If you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can follow along with me if you want to. Matthew 14 and verse 22, it says this, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. So this will require just a little bit of explanation. So Jesus had just done one of the most incredible miracles, and the disciples were having an amazing day. That's where they were at right then. Uh, so let me just kind of rewind a little bit and tell you what just occurred, because it has a lot to do with the story, and it's something that Jesus wanted them to understand, but they didn't quite get the lesson. They got lost in how amazing the miracle was that he did, and they, and they didn't get the lesson. So, so here's what happened. Uh, Jesus had been preaching. He came to this area uh, that was kind of a small town. Um, it reminds me a lot of where uh, some of us at Rivers United Church, I don't know where you're watching from, and if you're watching it from a big city, great, but we live in a very rural area in Isle of Wight County where there's places like Zuni or Carsville or Walters and um, just some place, Sedley, for the, you guys that live out there, and it's a small town area, but thousands of people came to see him. In fact, 5,000 people showed up in this real little teeny area. It kind of reminds us, me of the fairgrounds that we have out here. That they all just came and they wanted to come see Jesus. And, and it was an amazing day of Jesus teaching practically and all that. But Jesus went a little bit long-winded. So, in fact, he preached from morning and he had preached all the way till it started to get dark in the evening. So, I never want to hear you guys complain about me going over. <laughs> I'm just playing. You, you go, hey, if you preach like Jesus, we wouldn't mind you doing that. So anyway, I don't. And um, so he's an amazing communicator. But, but his disciples said, hey, look, there's some Baptists here, so we got to end this. No, I'm just playing. Uh, but they said, hey, Jesus, it's getting late, and there's families with kids, and they haven't ate all day, and we don't have any food because we didn't realize you were going to preach so long. And we have to send them away because we're out in the middle of the boondocks like we are out here, and there's no Dairy Queen out in Zuni or Carsville. There's just nothing out here. And uh, so they're going to need to go. And Jesus said, well, let me ask you a question. What do you have? And, and they said, well, we don't have anything. Oh, well, well, what we do have is we found this boy, and he basically had a fish sandwich from his mom. Okay? That's what we have. And Jesus took the fish sandwich. That's basically what it says right before this. And he said, let's pray. And he looked up to heaven. Let me ask you a question. When you pray, where do you look? Do you look down at your circumstances? I'm not talking about bowing your head in reverence. That's a good thing. But what I'm talking about is when you pray, are you looking down at your circumstances? Or are you looking up to God? Down at the scarcity or up at the abundance of God? Really big deal. Really big piece of the lesson we're about to learn. Jesus looked up to heaven and he thanked God for the food and about we're about to receive. And his disciples were thinking, what are you talking about? 
And then he told them to pass it around, and they had been around him enough to trust him. And so they started to pass it around, and it fed everybody that was there. And in fact, they said they had all these baskets of food left over, and it was amazing. And this is the moment they came to. But Jesus is thinking to himself, this is not the lesson that I wanted for you guys. You didn't have faith about provision, and you think it's all about just the miracle. And you're missing the point, as many of us are. So the lesson continues. He sent them in a boat. Here's what happens next, verse 23. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. So you get the picture, right? The disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee, which is more like a lake, honestly. And Jesus went up by himself to pray. Okay. Verse 24, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it, okay? So they just had an amazing day. Now they're trying to cross the Sea of Galilee, which is not real big, but it is a, it's, a, it's kind of a volatile area. So what I have to do is I might have to explain a little bit of geography, which is kind of funny for those of you that know me. I am geographically challenged. I get lost everywhere I go. It's one of the reasons why GPS has been my best friend um, I can get lost all the time for places that I actually go. But I, this one, I think, is important that you understand the geography. So they are crossing the, the Sea of Galilee to the west. Okay, they're, they're coming from the east to the west. And as you cross, on the other side is a mountain range. Okay, and, and the other side of that mountain range is a big sea. Not like the Sea of Galilee that's like a lake, but a big sea called the Mediterranean Sea. Some of you guys are in the Navy and stuff and know about that. And so as they're crossing, the Mediterranean Sea causes a lot of weather issues. And then when you add mountains to that, the wind and stuff comes from the Med and it goes through kind of a wind tunnel. And when it gets to the Sea of Galilee, it stirs it up and causes all kinds of problems. And they have that all the time. It's kind of like in our area where if you're out in the Chesapeake Bay and you're getting a storm surge, the Chesapeake Bay can be great. But then all of a sudden it gets stirred up. And if you've ever been out there, it's terrifying. And that's where they're at. And they're past the point of no return, right? They can't get back to shore and they can't seem to get across it. And they are battling these waves all night long. Now, there, there's a couple things I want you to consider about this. The first thing is this, is that when you're in a storm, when you're in a storm of life, okay, you get, you get the analogy, right? We're not just talking about real storms, but, but the storms that you're facing in life, and they feel like real storms. Blaming will never help you. Blaming will never help you get through it. And if you do get through it, if you survive it, and you get to the other side, and it's all about blaming and just avoiding it or getting through it and not learning from it, you'll never learn the lesson that God wants you to have. And he didn't want them to miss this one. <laughs> this is really important. There's something else about the story that I wanted you to see, and that's this. That Jesus, from where Jesus was at, by the way, when they were out at the sea, it was black and dark, and you couldn't see anything except for the lightning, then you would see stuff every now and then. But from Jesus' vantage point, where he was on, he was up on the other side, on a mountainside praying, he could see them the whole time. Now, they couldn't see him, but he could see them. I think somebody needed to hear that today. Can I say that a different way? Whatever you're going through today, you, you may not be able to see God in it, but God can see you. That's, that's so big. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. That's what I said. It, the Sea of Galilee is kind of like a lake. <laughs> Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Walking on the lake. Shortly, I want you to get the timing of it. The King James Version puts it this way. It says, the fourth watch. That might not make sense, but, but, the, but it's like three hour segments. And the fourth watch is basically between 3 a.m., in 6 a.m. The sun hasn't come up yet, so they have been out on the lake all night long battling it, and then Jesus comes. <laughs> I'll tell you about God's timing. If God is there to relieve us from the storm, his timing is way off, isn't it? But that's not his point, is it? His point wasn't to relieve them. His point isn't to relieve us from the storm. His point was this, his timing, it, now this one might make more sense. It's not about relief, it's about revelation. He has something he wants to show them through the storm. 
You see, Jesus could have calmed that storm at any time. But instead, he chose to walk on it. Jesus walked on the thing that they feared most. And he's coming to deliver the lesson that they never got. Now, I want to be careful how I say that because I realize some of you guys are going through some unbelievable storms in your life. And I'm not here today to to explain or explain away the pain that God has allowed into your life, only to say that we can trust God with some of the things we don't understand. And God has a purpose and a plan even in some of the worst things that we have. But from this, we can learn how to trust God, okay? Okay, let's keep going. Verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. (laughs) It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. (laughs) Uh, That's understandable, right? I mean, like, have you seen anybody walking on the lake? Now, understand, it's so black, they can't see anything. And so the flash, I really believe it's more like this. The flashes of lightning come, and when they do, they see something out there walking on the lake, right? Uh, and they know, the, the rules of physics say, you can't walk on water. You're heavier than that. You'll sink in it. You, you, won't, you, you won't be walking on it for sure. And so they're like, maybe it's a ghost. Now, here's the thing. They don't believe in ghosts. It, fear will, will distort your perspective, right? It just makes things seem so much bigger and, and scarier. And they cried out, not in faith. This is why it's connected to the first part of the, what, what Jesus had done at the beginning. And after they saw Jesus' miracles, they didn't cry out in faith. They cried out in fear. Okay, let's take a look at the next part. Here's what Jesus says. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Verse 27, But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. (laughs) Uh, In the King James, you know what it says? It doesn't say take courage. You know what it says? It says be of good cheer. (laughs) It's almost like a teacher or a parent that is... (laughs) they're getting a little bit of enjoyment seeing their kids a little scared. I don't think he was doing that. I think what he was doing is is he's going, hey, this is the lesson. Here I am, right? Here I am. And, And he's trying so hard to get them to see the lesson he wants them to see. That it's designed not to give them relief. If he would want to do that, he could have came at the first watch or the second watch or the third watch. Somebody, that's where you're at today. And he's saying, don't be afraid, even when it's the fourth watch. That God's timing about this storm isn't about relief, it's about revelation. And when he gives you the lesson, the lesson is so much more important than the relief. (laughs) Okay, verse 28. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied... (laughs) So Peter's on the boat, and he says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. (laughs) Tell me to come to you on the water. Now, i got to love Peter, and this is how I relate to him. He's one of these guys uh, growing up that he would be, hey, hold my beer and watch this. I'm kind of one of those guys. (laughs) Maybe not the beer anymore, but but hold my beer and watch this. This is Peter. Man, you know what? I, I'm so scared about this storm, but it is so awesome that you're out there, and I don't know if it's you. So this big faith moment, it's not like Peter's trusting in Jesus. He's just going, if it really is you, I want to do it too, man. And some of you guys, that's right where you are. This impulsive spirit, this impulsive spirit that Peter had, and uh, it's pretty cool because he got to try something amazing. I, I want you to see what Jesus said, though, because it's huge to this story. Verse 29. Come. Come. <laughs> His, his, his word to Peter was, come. And I got a feeling that Peter was going, uh, I was actually kind of hoping you would give me some instruction, right? Like, not come, literally, but like, give me a little bit of instructions on how do I walk on the water, right? I mean, like, do, wh- how does that work? I mean, like, you're, you're telling me to come, but I don't know how to do that, right? I mean, like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> Some of us, that's right where you are. You're waiting on God 
to give you a little bit better command. And maybe you're thinking like Peter, hey, you know when you say come, you know what that means? That's kind of like how you talk to a dog, isn't it? That's, that's a little bit degrading, God. So what I need to do is I need to study more. I need to think about this more. I need more instruction, right? Because God's messages often come not in details, <laughs> but in one simple answer. And some of us go, well, we need to go deep and we need to study more, right? Is that what you're thinking? You know, like, like, like God's word to you is, it might be today, forgive, right? Instead of saying come, he's saying, hey, you know that person that you've been holding on to that grudge? It's time for you to forgive. And you know, we like to say, we like to go, well, it's not that simple. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a Bible study on forgiveness. I'll go to a Bible study and I'll hide behind my studying instead of doing what God said. But you're not blessed by studying. You're blessed by doing. That's what this lesson is all about. And Jesus' word to him was simple, but it was profound. And it's the same thing that we need in our life, following the words of Jesus. By the way, Peter did. You know what he did? Peter got down out of the boat, <laughs> walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. Now, I don't know how long this lasted, but I will tell you, it's one of the most incredible moments that you will ever see in your entire life. <laughs> It's one of the most incredible things and experiences that Peter ever had. Jesus said, come. Peter did it, and he actually got to walk on the water. Okay, here's what happens next. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. <laughs> and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. <laughs> okay. He had kind of a wily coyote moment. I used to like those cartoons as a kid. Um, I know some people are kind of weird about that with the violence and stuff, but I, I love them. I think they're awesome. But anyway, um, and I'm not here to tell you whether you should watch Wile E. Coyote. But Wile E. Coyote would be chase, chasing the roadrunner, and then he would run off. He would run off a cliff. And when he ran off the cliff, remember what happened? It was like he was fine running off the cliff until he realized he was out there, and then he fell. And that's kind of the moment that Peter had. I, I had a moment like that in my life um, a few, well, several years ago when my son was a teenager, uh, we took some kids out on a boat that somebody let us borrow. Some of you guys have heard my stories before, but this is my message, so I get to tell it. And, uh, and so I was out, I was about 40 pounds heavier than I am now, um, so I wasn't as even in good shape as I am now, which isn't great, but it was worse then. And so we went out on the boat, and, uh, and we decided to try a kneeboard. I'd never been on a kneeboard. I had been water skiing, and that was my big thing. So I went out and what I decided to do is, is uh, I was going to show the kids how to do it. And so I told Marie, I was like, go as fast as you can because I'm kind of heavy. So it will get me up out of the water. And, and I didn't realize that you're supposed to go slower when you uh, kneeboard. <laughs> but anyway, I was, we were going super fast, as fast as the boat could go. And I decided that I was going to jump the wake. I had went right, right across it a couple times. And I decided, hey, I'm going to jump this wake because I do it on water skis and I can jump from one side to the other. I don't know about now that I'm so fat, right? <laughs> um, but I decided, hey, I'm going to jump this wake. And so I jumped and I got some air. It was pretty awesome. The kids looked kind of amazed, or at least that's the way I remember it. And, uh, and, then, and then I was going to land. And I realized I looked down. And my board went straight into the water. Not like this, not, not, not like you're supposed to, but straight down into the water. <laughs> and then I went six feet underneath the water, at least that's what it felt like, and the board hit me in the back of the head, still strapped to my legs. And at that point, I realized, you know what? Water sports could hurt. I, I've never been hurt doing it before. I always thought, hey, man, you're made out of rubber. You can do all this stuff. It's no big deal. But uh, it hurt. <laughs> And then we watched some videos later on how to do this. We watched them on YouTube. And you know what it told us? It said, hey, here's what you got to do. First off, slow the boat down. <laughs> Second, when you come up, you pull, the, you pull the rope back towards you. And then wherever your, your eyes are, whatever you're looking at, whatever you're focused on, that's where you'll go. So if you're looking down, you're going to go down. If you're looking up, what they want you to do is look up. Your, your instinct is going to be to look down. But if you look up, the front of that board will go up. And it was really true. And so we started to jump very slowly at first and later. And we were able to do it because where your eyes are, that's where you're going to go. Can I tell you what the lesson is here? Where your eyes are, that's where you're going to go. And Peter got his eyes on his circumstances. And he started to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Okay, here's what you got to see next. Verse 31, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. The next part that he says is so weird to me. He says, you of little faith, he said, why 
did you doubt? Now, I thought to myself, why would you say that to Peter? <laughs> I mean, you say you have little faith. It took a lot of faith to get out of that boat. That's big faith, right? But what Jesus meant by little faith, you have little faith, wasn't that Peter didn't have a lot of faith getting out of the boat. It was that it had more to do with the length of his faith than it did the strongness at the start. Hey, I know you can be impulsive. I know you can be that guy that says, hold my beer and watch this. But why didn't it sustain, sustaining faith? He's saying, you have little faith. This is the lesson he wanted. But now I need you to see posture just for a minute. Because Jesus posture wasn't what I used to teach and what I thought it was, which was like a reprimand, like Jesus was saying, you of little faith. That's not what he was doing. It was this, an outstretched arm, not a pointing finger. The other part I want you to see is, is when he did it. As soon as Peter said, Jesus caught him. That's the lesson. How do you walk on water, Peter? You see, you thought it was about your ability, <laughs> but it wasn't. It wasn't about your ability. It was about Jesus' ability. It wasn't about your ability, your, your feet ability, or your skill set to walk on water. It was about Jesus' ability to catch you before you sink. That's the lesson. <laughs> That's the lesson. The lesson for some of us today is this. You are in a storm. And you are trying so hard. And the lesson that God wants you to learn today is so counterintuitive. It's going against everything that we would talk about in self-help and all that kind of stuff. And it's this. Stop striving and start trusting. Because you can't get past the storm. It is not about your ability to walk or a skill set that you have learned. It's about God's ability to catch you. It's about Jesus' ability to catch you. Stop striving and start trusting. Verse 32, And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. <laughs> Isn't that funny? The lesson's over. The storm was the lesson. That's big. I, I, I pause here because I don't want you to miss that. Because of what happens next, and I don't think they got it that day, and I don't know. I've been teaching this story for a long time, and I think I'm just now starting to get it. But it is the greatest lesson that there has ever been. When he got in the boat, the storm calmed down. You see, Jesus could have calmed that storm at any time. He could have start, calmed it on watch one or watch two or watch three, but he waited till watch four, and he waited till the test was over. Here's what I want you to know, that Peter failed the test. <laughs> but he got the lesson. Some of us, that's right where you are. He learned to fall. You know, one of the things, I do a lot of snow skiing, and one of the things, the first thing I teach people when you go, like if you bring a kid with you or something, is how to fall down so you don't get hurt. Because you are going to fall in this life. And Jesus was teaching him how to fall into Jesus. To fall into Jesus. Not your ability, but to Jesus. He could have calmed the storm, but he chose to walk on it. The other thing I want you to see is this. Is that you find Jesus. You want to really know him? You find him in the storm. The portal to knowing Jesus. <laughs> the portal to knowing him is in the pain. It's in the suffering. It's in the storm. I, I don't pretend to know what you're going through or to diminish any part of that, but I will tell you this. You will find God way more in your pain than you do in your triumph. And that's what he's teaching Peter, and it changed his life forever. Now, he didn't get it that day, and I'm going to show you right now the last verse so you can know they didn't really get it until later. But next week, we're going to tell you how it changed the course of Peter's life and the world. And it can for you too. So you got to come back next week because we got so much more to talk about. But before we can have what we want to talk about next week, you got to get what they're talking about today. Verse 33. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. 
This whole thing led to worship. And I don't want to take anything away from that moment, only to say they were worshiping God in a moment, and it's awesome, but they didn't get it. They didn't get it till much later. They didn't get this lesson because they repeated it. By the way, if we don't get it, we'll repeat it again. I know because I've repeated it over and over, and I'm just now starting to say, you know what, maybe I could start to apply this to my life. It's about focus. So for today, here's what I want to give you. We've got so much more we want to talk about next week, but I just want to give you the lesson. The lesson from the storm, how to not drown in your storms in life. Here, here's how you do it. Focus on Jesus. <laughs> That's kind of simple, isn't it? It's kind of simple like, come. It's simple, but when the storms come, it's a lot harder. So I want to give you three things to kind of look through this lens as you consider your life. You might want to write this down. Here's the three things. Focus on Jesus, not the storm. <laughs> Does that make sense? You focused on Jesus where, where Peter messed up was when he got his focus off of Jesus. Mm. You see, it wasn't his ability to walk. It was, his, it was the word of God that changed him. It was the word that, that saved him. I wanted you to see that. Focus on Jesus, not the storm. Number two, focus on Jesus, not blaming not blaming other people, not blaming God, not saying prayers like, God, how could you do this to me? Where are you in this situation? Stop blaming. Start trusting. Stop. The last one is the hardest, though. Focus on Jesus, not your abilities. You see, Peter got out of the storm not because he learned how to walk, not because of his ability. You see, his walking had nothing to do with his feet and everything to do with the Word of God. You see, when he said, Lord, save me, that's what changed his life. And that's what we have to understand. What's going to get you through are the promises of God. What's going to get you through is you calling out to God, crying out to God, crying out to God, not just in fear, but in faith. <laughs> that's what's going to save our lives. Focus on Jesus, not the storm. Focus on Jesus, not blaming other people, not blaming yourself, not blaming other people, not blaming God. And focus on Jesus, not my abilities. It's not in our striving, it's in our trusting. And I'm telling you, if you get this lesson, it will bless you. If you don't, it will curse you. You'll repeat it. So let me ask you a question today. Are you ready to change your focus? No matter what circumstances you're facing today, are you ready to be to get over top of them? Not just calm the storm but the ability to walk on this storm, realizing it's impossible with us. With man, it is impossible, but behold, with, all, with God, all things are possible. Can I pray for you today? Let's pray. Father God, I come before you today. Lord, I don't pretend to know where everybody's at, but I have a feeling just like myself and the crazy world that we live in, I have a feeling that there's somebody here today that's going through a storm. Maybe all of us. And if we're not going through a storm, we're prepping for the next one. Or we just got past one. And I'm praying today, God, that right in the middle of our storms, we get a lesson from you that says, hey, you know what? It's not about your ability. It's about my ability. That the lesson, Lord, that we have to get is that it takes your power to fulfill your calling. That's what you taught Peter, and that's what you'll teach us. God, we have so much more to talk about next week. But today, I pray, God, help us to change our focus to you right in the midst of whatever we're facing. And that we will see, just like your disciples, that our lives are connected, that you're allowing things to come in and out. And God, I don't pretend to know what somebody's going through or to explain their pain away, but I pray that in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their suffering, that they put their trust in you and that they will find you in the darkest of nights, in the worst of all storms, in the pieces where they say, I didn't know that anything's there, that you will use that as a portal to be there for them. God, I pray for the one that doesn't even know you as Savior, that they'll, that they'll have faith enough today to call out to you in their own words. God, save me. That's where it starts. And you'll come in and change their life. God, I pray for the one that maybe is a Christian. That, that they started getting where they study a lot, but they stopped doing what you said. Now, that's too simple. Maybe you're telling them to come. Maybe you're telling them to go. Maybe you're telling them to forgive. 
And I'm just praying right now, Lord, through your power, they'll start to be able to do that right now in a very tangible way. Father, we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.